The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Adam Sultan sauntered into the Empire Club, Sydney, and found awaiting him a letter from his granduncle. He had first heard from the old gentleman less than a year before, when Richard Sultan had claimed kinship, stating that he had been unable to write earlier, as he had found it very difficult to trace his grandnephew's address. Adam was delighted and replied cordially. He had often heard his father speak of the older branch of the family with whom his people had long lost touch. Some interesting correspondence had ensued. Adam eagerly opened the letter, which had only just arrived, and conveyed a cordial invitation to stop with his granduncle at Lesser Hill for as long a time as he could spare. So begins Lair of the White Worm by Bram Stoker. This episode on... Dread Dialectic. Dread Dialectic. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. This is Michael T. Bradley. This is Gix Maddox. And today we are going to discuss mm-hmm. Lair of the White Worm mm-hmm. by someone you might have heard of, Bram Stoker. Yeah, Mr. Dracula himself wrote many things. Dracula's the one he's best known for, and rightly so. I'm not a fan of Dracula, but that's not what we're here today to talk about. We're here today to talk about some white worms and the lairs. It's a nice day for a white worm. Uh, Skix, why don't you start us off with a brief plot synopsis? Okay, so our hero finds long-lost family in England somewhere. And... Our hero is Adam Sultan. Right, from Australia. And so he is... A... They're so boring. <laughs> but he meets family and friend of family, and they live near a castle and a mysterious house called Diana's Grove, and they discover dark underpinnings, some from the castle, some from the grove, and they're not related at all. They have nothing to do with each other. And it ends disappointingly. (laughs) I think the thing that you left out is that there is a mysterious woman living on in in Diana's Grove. In a uh, tight dress, as as they point out every single scene she's in. Lady Arabella, was it? Is that right, I think? Arabella, I think. Yeah, and so Adam's staying with his... Great uncle and great uncle's friend. I'm inclined to throw quotes around friend, but maybe, you know, it's hard to tell. They definitely both seem like confirmed bachelors. Something we're going to try incorporating into the kind of way that we do things here our process is uh next let's talk about trigger warnings i think the big big trigger warning that we got to point out here is racism like crazy and uh like mad be warned there's a lot of racism there's some violence to animals pretty kind of sudden violence to animals it's not really graphic but it's a little it's just thrown in there to make the woman look scary frankly speaking of which also sexism (laughs) quite a bit of sexism as well there's only one woman well no i was gonna say there's only one woman there are three women yeah and they're all described at one point or another as having the feminine intuition or the feminine way or doing something in the feminine way or having feminine knowledge it's about as progressive as a Tolstoy book, that's for sure. Both the uh, the sexism and the racism are fueled by junk science, if you know how to read between the lines, too. Uh, the, our other sections are the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, in the good, we'll discuss what we liked. In the bad, we'll discuss what we didn't like. And in the ugly, we will discuss the monster at the end of the book, and that will include spoilers. First two sections will try to keep it... Maybe not exactly spoiler-free, but fairly vague. So let's go ahead and start with the good. I liked the fact that Adam Sultan was kind of a fun protagonist, I thought. He reminded me of a puppy. He was just always like, oh, oh, you have a story? I bet it's long and boring. I want to hear it. Right after lunch. (laughs) I enjoyed that that was our main character, was this guy who just was apparently so milk toast that listening to his, like, 80-year-old great-uncle tell stories about the history of the veil was exciting to him. I mean, it was like, oh, this book could be called Adam Finds a Friend. Yes, I'll agree with that. He He's very much a product of his time, but when he's not busy being a blazing racist or, or sexist or opportunist, yeah, he's, he's kind of a nice character. I keep forgetting he's Australian. Uh, I think if I could have kept that in my mind, he would have been even more interesting, if I could imagine the accent. And and the other thing that I liked was the fact that his great-uncle's friend lives in Doom Tower. <laughs> they don't <laughs> Which really I, talk about I, that. I really wanted more. I was like, what the hell's the history of Doom Tower? Were they big Tolkien fans? Or what was going on there, you know? I think the base premise, and there are really two, it's like... 
two gothic gothic romances. We've got the lonely bachelor in a castle on a cliff, meddling in affairs, the best left buried. And then we've got the secret pagan monstrous hypersexualized woman lady in the woods. I think the latter one is interesting. All right. <laughs> the former where he had the, the, the chest full of mysteries from Mesmer, the theoretical inventor of theoretical hypnotism. Some of the junk science starts there, actually. Had potential, but then he got really obsessed with the kite, which made no sense. Yeah. I, I thought the kite was going to tie in because the birds hated the snakes, because we had this whole theme with the snakes, but then he just played with the kite, and it was like way up in the air, and that wouldn't have scared birds anymore, and he made lightning with it, which I don't understand how that happens. And, <sighs> and in general, this woman who might be a giant snake slithering through the woods, uh, and might be like a monster from before time, as they say, antediluvian, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I thought that was a decent premise and could have went somewhere for sure. And that's what the movie focused on, mostly. It's maybe not the most well thought out or like, it, it, no. it, 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 it's weird for a book with so much backstory. It doesn't really have that much backstory about the possible monster. Right. But yeah, it, in general, I think that could be something interesting to play around with. I don't think it really came off, but I, yeah, the basic idea, sure. But that, uh, let, let's go ahead and segue into the bad with that, the junk science. The Mesmer stuff I thought was fucking hilarious because <laughs> there's so many scenes in this book where just essentially people stare at each other and it's like a contest of wills and the first time Adam is describing this, I was like, okay, he's totally just making shit up because he likes this girl. And and when when the, the, the baddie, the, the, the lord of the castle, gets bested, He's literally backed out the door. But then the next time they meet, they're just like, let's have tea. It's everybody just is so damn British in this book. <laughs> yeah, people just keep staring at each other. And at times, different people lend their strength to the people staring each other down. And I'm just like, okay, why doesn't he just go hit her? You know, like, why doesn't he just go <laughs> knock her out and take her if that's what he's trying to do? But instead, it's some sort of, like, I didn't understand the point of it. Right. Like what, you know, I mean, I, I assume his point was he was going to command dominance over her mind or something. But he, he's uh, he's d depicted as fairly soulless. It's not like he fell in love with her and she's the farmer's daughter and he's the lord of the castle. And, and I don't know why he wanted to subdue her in particular and then punish everyone that was on her side. Like later on, he lists off all of his enemies because the uh, the narration kind of skips from person to person sometimes. All right. Which is okay for some authors to do, but in this case, I think we lost a lot. Because when, when we stay with our hero, we don't know the inner thoughts of the bad guys. But when we talk to the bad guys, they become way more bland. Caswell, I think, is the, the baddie, right? He's the guy right. who keeps staring at Lila and Mimi. And he is also the one with the kite. Let's let's talk about yes. the kite. What the hell is going on with the kite? The birds had set upon the area and were like eating all the food because he's a good lord of the manor. He wanted to help them out. So he made a kite shaped like a, a hawk, which scared away the birds. But then he became obsessed with the kite and he got it on some sort of winch so that it was always aloft. And so now there were no birds, and that's a problem too. And it's so quiet, everyone's in a bad mood. And he, he seemed to get so distracted by it, but then when the plot needed him to, he was back staring at Mimi and Lila. Like, people do this a lot in this book. Yeah. I, I remember it's like uh, Lady Arabelle at one point, they want to research her because they think she's a giant snake. And it's like, oh, luckily she was distracted by, and it was something ridiculous. I can't remember what it was, but I'm like, okay, as interested as she might be in that, if she's really a giant snake, probably her number one priority is keeping that hidden, right? She was, at one point, she was distracted by the sound of the pigeons because they made a, a sound a bit like a snake drummer's instrument. My favorite, like, people just turning on a dime uh, as far as motivation or plans or whatever go was at one point Adam says they think that Lady Arabelle is a giant snake and that they are they in, in trouble uh, right because it's those women um, and so he is in love with Mimi and so he says 
we have to save Mimi, and the way to protect her is through marriage. And so I, I, I want you to go propose for me because, I don't know, it's like 1632 or something, apparently. And then he's like, okay, now the second part of the plan is we can't let anyone know that we're married because that would put her in trouble. Yes. And it's yeah. like, wait, wait, this isn't, like, this isn't you even changing your mind. This is literally parts one and two of your plan, and they don't mesh up. And then part three was to take her to the Isle of Wight where she'd be safe. And so they took that trip out and then came home. Right. With her. <laughs> yeah. I Never explained. None of this made sense at all. Like, none of the... I kind of got the feeling that all of his, that all of his two older friends were basically like, yeah, sure, Adam, that's totally a good plan, because they knew he just wanted to marry this chick, right? Yeah. Let me just read you a few select quotes here. You would not think the place avail at all, unless you were told so beforehand and had confidence in the veracity of the teller. <laughs> This is how unveil like the area is. Like, if somebody was like, hey, check out that veil, if you barely knew them, you'd be like, oh, fuck you, dude. It's not a veil. <laughs> Some sort of electricity flashed. That divine spark which begins by recognition and ends in obedience. Men call it love. <laughs> what I think is interesting is that it's not even clear which side that's sexist on. <laughs> Because it's like, does it end in obedience for the women or the men? Or for both? Like, it just it just is icky. Yes. Also, there's this line, which is never really explained. Killing a few snakes in a morning was no new experience to him. <laughs> like, it's not? Maybe we want some backstory there? Like, what the hell? Is Australia just covered with snakes? Well, yes. <laughs> Here's my proof that these guys are confirmed bachelors. This is uh, one of the guys talking to Adam. He came close and whispered in his ear, We will prepare our plans to combat and destroy this horrible menace. Why would you go and whisper that gently into someone's ear? They were alone in the room, as they recall, when that happened. Yeah. So the junk psychology that I mentioned before, at the end, Brom goes off on this kind of, like, long diatribe and digression talking about what madness is. And it's like, okay... Madness starts with monomania, right? And then uh, monomania is being unable, and I don't even know if this is true, it's being unable to uh, differentiate proper uh, relationships between things, and then it always slides into someone thinking they're God. <laughs> like, I know that mental health has been uh, one of the sciences that we've, we haven't, you know, like, uh, the strides forward we've made have really only been in the past 50 years, but... But is that really what everybody thought madness was? Like, it only took one shape? Yeah. Uh, further that, it ties in with physiognomy, which I'm going to have a little speech about in a second. Okay. But uh, that quote, he's he's also wrong. Monomania is just being obsessed by one thing. That's all that is. That makes more sense with the Latin. <laughs> yes. Just just for background, physiognomy is the, the junk science that posits that you can tell something about a person by the way they're shaped by the way they're put together, um, and we're not talking about, oh, that guy's probably got a limp. We've got, this is a criminal face. This is a lustful face. This, uh, this is yada, yada, yada. And uh, this junk science uh, was one way they justified their racism, because clearly these kinds of features that we consider uh, low intelligence and violent and lustful coincidentally happen to be what black people look like. <laughs> I have a very specific quote that ties right into that, and so for the quotes, anytime that the N-word is used, much like in the past, I will insert Strom Thurmond instead. I'm sure he'd love that. But the face of Ulonga, fucking Ulonga, alright? <laughs> Ulonga is our only African American character in here. But the face of Ulonga, as his master called him, was unreformed, unsoftened savage, and inherent in it were all the hideous possibilities of a lost, devil-ridden child of the forest and the swamp, the lowest of all created things that could be regarded as in some form ostensibly human. Yeah, they, uh, their, their description of him when he first arrives is probably more, more descriptive than any other character's, uh, arrival on the scene. 
and includes some of his background. He's apparently West African. He comes in on a boat named West African, so... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I assume right. he is, but yeah, it was a little on the nose. But he, he's he's definitely not an escaped slave. He's 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 some some from the continent of Africa, but he's also described as being a voodoo priest, which is from the islands. Uh, and and there was another thing I caught where where they, I don't know. And then they do the thing like African is one language and all that bullshit. But they they describe him regularly, regularly, repeatedly as as ugly, grotesque, stupid, uh, animalistic, usually using Strom Thurmond over and over and over gratuitously. I mean, this is clearly a point of contention for the author. And plot-wise, he does nothing for the plot. I mean, honestly, there, I, I don't see any, any point in this character except to be abused by the writer. He is much like the black character in most horror, there to be, I don't think it's a huge spoiler, he's there to be the victim to show off the bad creature, you know? I mean, that's basically his only purpose in the entire plot. But it mixes it up because he's an un unrepentant evil victim of the creature. Strom Thurmond is just used over and over and over again. At, at one point, I started thinking, could this just be like... You know, I don't, I don't think it was ever like a good word, but could it just be that Brom thought it was an acceptable word? But this is uh, Lady Arabelle uh, talking to him because he's uh, in love with Lady Arabelle. And she says to him, I have no desire to be seen so close to my own house in conversation with a, a, a Strom Thurmond like you. She had chosen the word deliberately. So she chooses it deliberately because she knows that it is going to have negative connotations, which means that every time that it's used in the text, Brahm has used it deliberately. And honestly, even as written, you know, I mean, uh, Ulanga is a, a caricature and, and, and horrible, but even as written, I feel sorry for it because he's mostly confused. He thinks he understands what's going on and he doesn't. Yeah. He proposes love of a sort? And he's treated very shabbily for it instead of simply turned down. A couple times we've got a direct quote from him. He doesn't have a real clear hang of English either. The one thing that I didn't highlight that I do remember also talking about the physiognomy is Ulanga can smell death. And when they yes. talk about when they talk about that, they mention very specifically the wide, wide nose that he has. And it's like black people naturally have wide noses, therefore they can smell death. Like what sort of fucking anatomy I mean, book are you working from? And he approved of it. <laughs> he, he liked death. From Ulonga, this might have been expected by anyone who knew the character of the tropical African savage. To such, there are two passions that are inexhaustible and insatiable. Vanity and that which they are pleased to call love. Yeah, what you're pleased to call love is pretty shitty too there, buddy. <laughs> oh my god. the uh, Mimi and her, like, you know, it's like you have to be sweet and kind and wrapped in innocence. Let me give you a word of advice. If you have the slightest fault to find, th let me just emphasize that, the slightest fault to find with that infernal Strom Thurmond, shoot him at sight. A swelled headed Strom Thurmond with a bee in his bonnet is one of the worst difficulties in the world to deal with. And then when the person, um, that they're talking to says like, oh, but you know, what about the law? Oh, the law doesn't concern itself much about dead Strom Thurmonds. A few more or less do not matter. To my mind, it's rather a relief. I don't love Strom Thurmonds any more than you do, she replied, and I suppose one mustn't be too particular where that sort of cleaning up is concerned. When a Strom Thurmond suspects he is being laughed at, all the ferocity of his nature comes to the front, and this man was of the lowest kind. I mean, this is the narrator, you know? This, <laughs> this is, that's not somebody in quotes talking about it. So the one thing was I was like, I don't think Adam uses it, so maybe he's trying to say something minor there, but the woman turned sharply as Adam touched her shoulder. One moment whilst we are alone. You had better not trust that Strom Thurmond, he whispered. So Adam just throws it out there too. Yeah. Th those are the ones that I found, like, just egregious enough to be like, holy shit, like, this is worth talking about. It's shocking to me how unfair the narrator is to Uwanga. There is a definite distinction to be made between 
what's being said in the book, even what the narrator says and what the author says. Yeah. So you can have a narrator who's, you know, a jerk, but it's very clear that the authorial voice isn't along for that ride. Mm -hmm. And then you have books like this, where the, the authorial voice is the narrator, and both of them are racist fucking assholes. It's pretty depressing. So... Hey, bro. <laughs> so let's move on to the ugly. So definite spoilers ahead. Turn off the podcast now if you have any interest in reading this for yourself for whatever reason. Even if you've seen the movie, this is a different ending. She's a giant worm. The only unclear is whether she's the only one. Because when, when the worm is exploded... It seems to me there's an instance where we've got dead worm guts in the well, and she's still out there, so there's got to be two worms. Oh, I thought I thought that was her, though, in the well, because she... Well, I, I did, too, until we spotted her outside the well after the explosion. Did we? I don't even remember that. I, uh, uh, I might be imagining it. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it, I found that whole ending very unclear, but I what I do remember is her going down into the well for something and then it exploding which i love their whole plan because it's like okay here's my plan we're gonna fill the well up with sand and uh that's like adam talking and the one of the old guys is like okay i guess that's cool but that doesn't really stop the worm and he's like you haven't heard part two <laughs> and we fill it with dynamite <laughs> Yeah, you buried the lead there, buddy. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, I love Adam. Like, I really just, I mean, except for the racism, I like him so much, you know? I, now, the very first step is buying the house for some reason, even though Arabelle didn't leave it. I, 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 I don't understand that step. I think what summed it up for me was this quote. I never thought this fighting an antediluvian monster would be such a complicated job. Hey, nobody thought healthcare would be this complicated. So that's exactly what I thought of when I read that. <laughs> Another quote that I liked about it was <laughs> describing the white worm and its uh, abilities. The white worm in her own proper shape certainly has great facilities for the business on which she is now engaged. She can look into windows of any ordinary kind. <laughs> like... Is that... That's your superpower? Yeah, like, how is that a superpower? <laughs> like, I, I can do that. And she's apparently covered in white clay is, is another oddity. I'm not sure she transforms into the big worm so much as she's a projection of it. Yeah, it's really unclear. Because it's like, wait, she really transforms into a giant worm? Isn't there some sort of conservation of mass going on here? Like, how does that work? That was another one of my favorite moments where I believe it's Adam again. Because Adam gets all the best fucking quotes. Where he's like... I have a theory on why it's known as the white worm and everybody's like oh oh let me know let me know because the, the white worm is like this myth in the area and he's like i think it's because it was white <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I got a chuckle on that one too. and i was like yeah fucking tell me more adam and so <laughs> it's you know it's like oh there's white clay underground here so blah 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 blah, blah. but a lot of their reasoning is like that there, there's like, hey, I have, I have figured it out. Oh, tell me. Well, I shouldn't tell you yet until your uncle gets back. <laughs> no, tell me now. I promise to let him in on the secret. Well, after lunch then. And so they had lunch. And then the next morning, for some reason, uh, he went to his uncle's friend's den and he said, well, let us get some sherry and I'll tell you the rest. <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of like... Okay, so Bill lived in this place, right? And here's how much he owed on rent, and here's how much this, and, you know, and here he was on his third wife, and his first two were like this, and blah, 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 blah. And then one night, he encountered a werewolf. Anyway, I'll continue the story in the morning. <laughs> and it's always like, what? Like, wait, wait, skip to that part. Jesus, guys. And they try to do kind of a Sherlock Holmes thing once in a while, where, like, there's a mystery, and they figure it out simply by, by deducing, but they're really bad at it <laughs> i don't know if if they're bad at it or if the world is just so bizarre that it's you know that it works i mean it, it seems like such an offhand well maybe sort of hypothesis but like and then the story ends like oh i'm sure you're right <laughs> that sounds exactly correct they're all so supportive of each other yeah so this is also uh kind of tying into the sexism and the fucking mesmerism so caswell stares at Lilla so hard that she dies. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and Mimi is upset by this, right? She's just seen her, I think they're cousins, she's just seen her cousin die right in front of her. And then Caswell just leaves. 
When Mimi was quite alone with Lilla and the need for effort had ceased, she felt weak and trembled. In her own mind, she attributed it to a sudden change in the weather. <laughs> like, oh, my cousin has just died right in front of me and now I have no protection from this horrible man who wants to take me away, who doesn't know that I'm actually not available because I'm married, because we can't tell him, even though the entire point of that plan was so that he would stop ch or I, I don't know. I don't even know what the fucking point of that plan was. But in any case, I must feel bad because it's going to rain soon. I think being married is going to make her stronger to resist. Oh, is that? Because, like, holding someone's hand made her stronger. So, like, being married would, like, really bolster her, her morale, I Is guess. this some sort of magician's bullshit where, like, semen gives her magic powers? <laughs> Maybe that's exactly, well, I mean, that's the whole white worm metaphor then, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, but the white worm is a woman, so... Well, she is a woman, but she's described a few times as having unwomanly uh, attributes. Sure. Such as super strength. Her long, slender fingers, which was, I don't know, meant to imply, I don't know, I don't know what he was going for. Maybe just they looked like worms. Let's wrap this up with, would you recommend this book, Skix? <laughs> Fuck no, but I'll watch the movie with someone if we have something to drink along. Except for the fact that I hate Dracula, and if I found somebody who really loved Dracula, maybe just to shatter their illusions, I would recommend it. <laughs> like, just to be a dick. Just to be like, oh, you like Dracula? You really need to read Lair of the White Worm. And then when they come to me crying, I'll just laugh and be like, yeah, yeah, that's what you get! <laughs> I have to assume Dracula was written with more editorial oversight. I also thought maybe this is intended to be kind of a turning Dracula on its head. I mean, Dracula is all about kind of masculine power over women and a, a monster who is strangely seductive to women, whereas this is about uh, a woman who is trying to take over men's souls, maybe? I mean, it's never she's quite clear. She's no good at it. She, she, she doesn't get control over anyone. No one. Caswell could kind of be seen as a parody of Dracula, right? I mean, yeah. he, he's, you know, he's like, oh, I'll stare at you until you fall into my will, but, you know, if I stare too hard, you die. And I've got my toys in the attic to play with. I cannot imagine, except for, like, a scholarly paper, why anyone would want to force themselves through this piece of shit. We read it, so you don't have to. <laughs> yeah. But I'll end on a bit of a positive note here. He uses Wentz correctly, and that made me happy. <laughs> and I do like at the end that Mimi gets a little bit of, uh, uh, she gets a little bit of a freak on. It's, it's, it's like, oh, I'd like to finally have my honeymoon, she said, smiling shyly at him. And it's like, oh, yeah, she wants the D. <laughs> uh, Lady Arab, actually, I have a question about the D. Well, not, not directly. Although, we, we, didn't, we didn't go Freudian on this really much at all, and we sure could. Yeah, uh, I, I feel like that's there, even though I don't know exactly what's going on. There's a scene in the finale storm where Lady Arabelle strips naked and sits on Caswell's couch. But nothing came of that, did it? I don't, I don't recall anything going on. Like, next thing we know, uh, our heroes are walking through the woods and there's copper wire on the ground. And like, oh, the lightning's gonna hit it. Ooh! Lady Arabelle must have put that down. Yeah, well, I, you know, that just seemed to me one of those many things, like... So much of the descriptions and so much of the plans and everything where it was like, it was just purely written to mock or point out the differences about a character, you know? It was like, mm -hmm. oh, she stripped down and it was all so savage and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, then she went in the ground and exploded. You know, sometimes there are just more mysteries than answers. I've heard that somewhere. <laughs> all right. Well, for now, this is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Geeks Maddox. And we are... <laughs>